Hey, it's Dave from CG Shortcuts. Today, we're looking at 15 ways to render faster with Redshift in Cinema 4D. This tutorial was brought to you by CG Shortcuts Pro Membership, where members get access to all of our premium training and tutorials, loads of time-saving assets, an online community, and direct help and support to learn Cinema 4D faster. Check it out at cgshortcuts.com forward slash membership or over on Patreon. Now let's get back to the tutorial. Before we get started, to make things even easier, we've also put together a handy Redshift render checklist you can download for free over at cgshortcuts.com forward slash Redshift. We'll also add a bunch of Redshift resources to this page as we go, so it should be worth checking out if you'd like to learn a bit more about the software. So let's begin with step number one, which is going to be updating our software and hardware to make sure that we don't run into any issues when we go to render. So we want to make sure we're on the latest version of Cinema 4D and Redshift in the Maxon app, and that we've also installed the latest drivers for our graphics card. And with an NVIDIA card, you can easily do that with the GeForce Experience app. Then it's also going to help if we close all the other programs we've got open that could potentially eat up our RAM and drain our computer's resources, which we could otherwise put towards rendering in Cinema 4D. This includes After Effects because it can be super resource heavy, so we'll close that before hopping into Cinema 4D and especially before rendering. And it's also a good idea to purge all memory and disk cache before shutting After Effects down as well to free up our RAM and get rid of any unnecessary files. Chrome is another big memory hog, so we'll also want to shut that down as well, or at least close as many tabs as we can because they also take up RAM and slow things down over in Cinema 4D. And that goes for any other browser we might be using as well. So now that we've got that out of the way, we can fire up C4D and that'll bring us to step three, which is optimizing your Cinema 4D scenes before we even start rendering. Because the more optimized we can make our projects, the faster they're going to be to render. And this includes keeping the polygon count as low as possible, caching, baking, and converting dynamics to alembic files, not using huge textures, and removing anything in our scene that isn't needed or isn't going to be rendered. And that includes getting rid of any materials we're no longer using as well. Just the kind of stuff we should be doing anyway when we build and organize our scenes. So when we're done with that, let's activate Redshift Renderer and switch to Advanced Mode. And because Redshift has a progressive renderer for faster feedback while we're working on our scenes and a bucket renderer for final output, let's look at optimizing both of those to speed up our entire Redshift workflow. So to preview our scene, we don't wanna be using the Redshift IPR because it can actually be quite slow and it also makes navigating around our scene a bit harder. And it has a lot less options than the alternative which is to use the Redshift Render View, which we can find up here in the Redshift menu. And we can easily dock that window into here as well. And I might just switch to one of my save layouts, which has everything exactly the way I like, which I also recommend you set up to save a bit of time. So we'll start the render and we'll go through some of the ways to optimize this and get faster render previews. And one of the best tools for that is going to be the Render Region tool which we can also use by holding shift and clicking and dragging across our image to isolate the render to just that area, which is obviously going to render much faster than rendering the whole thing. So if I was working on this logo, I'd isolate that while making tweaks and material changes to keep things running nice and fast. Then I might move on to another area by repositioning this over another object like the rocks, for example. So that's going to be a huge time saver. Next, we have the Freeze Tessellation and Geometry Updates buttons. And Geometry refers to any objects we have in our scene. And Tessellation is when we have subdivision applied via a Redshift object tag, as we've got set up here to smooth objects out or to add displacement. But if you're working on your lighting and materials, it's not likely you're going to need to mess with your objects or displacement. So you might as well lock them so the renderer has one less thing to calculate every time it restarts which again will speed things up for you. And the other thing here that'll make a big difference to your previews is the window scale. I'd suggest setting this to fit window and to just keep this window as small as it can be while giving you a good view of your scene because the smaller the window, the less pixels Redshift needs to render and the faster you'll be able to work. And finally, if we look under the view menu, setting the IPR under sampling to five will also increase responsiveness in the render view especially when navigating around your scene. 
So that's the render view settings, but let's take a look at what we can do in the Redshift render settings. So I'll hit Control B to bring those up. And by default, with our render view set to progressive renderer, it can take quite a long time for the frame to completely finish rendering. And that's because the progressive passes are set to 1024, which is quite high. But if we knock this right down to as low as 32, with a lot less samples, that render is going to complete much faster. And when it does, not only do we now get a frame render time, but I think our preview image is still good enough to work with. Although there is a little bit more grain than if we let it go to the full 1024 samples. But limiting this to 32 samples instead is going to free up that GPU faster and keep things running a lot more smoothly. And if you wanted to clean up that extra noise, you could also use this in conjunction with the denoiser as well. So we'll enable that. And we can use either the optics or OIDN denoising methods in progressive mode. And I like to drop the overhead on those down to zero, which will defer any denoising until after the frame has finished rendering. And you can see as soon as that's done, our denoising kicks in and cleans up that image. And we can toggle between the denoised and the original image with this button here. So that's a good method for optimizing your progressive renderer to keep your previews nice and fast while you're setting up your lights and materials. But let's switch to bucket mode now and see what we can optimize for our final rendered output. And straight away, you'll see that the bucket renderer is quite a bit slower than the progressive mode. And it doesn't actually use the lower samples that we set up for the progressive renderer, but instead it's using the unified sampling down here. It's set to 0.01 by default, which is great for your final render, but not so good for doing quick previews in the render view. So increasing this value will decrease the quality of the render, but render much faster with a little bit more noise, similar to what we just did in progressive mode. And we can actually take this beyond one as well and render even faster, which will also result in a noisier image, which probably isn't that big of a deal while you're working on your materials anyway. And just like we did before, we can also denoise the bucket renderer as well. And all four of these denoiser methods will work in bucket mode. And because we've set the overhead to zero in this mode as well, it'll finish the render before computing the denoising as well. Optics and OIDN are typically the fastest methods, but do tend to result in the loss of detail, while the Altus methods are quite a bit slower. But when this render is done, that should kick in, and it should usually give us a sharper result and get rid of most of that extra noise, like so. And again, we can toggle between the original and the denoised render up here. But I personally rarely use the denoiser for a final render because there's always going to be a level of lost detail. But it can be useful to give you a rough idea of what the final render is going to look like while you're previewing your image. So you can work with much lower sample counts. Then when I am ready to render out a final image, I usually just switch this threshold back to a smaller number like 0.01 to get a slower but sharper final output. And these days I also use automatic sampling almost all of the time, rather than setting overrides for everything separately. Because automatic sampling usually does a better job of optimizing the samples than I could do. And it's much quicker and easier to set up as well. So I'd suggest just leaving this switched on if you want to save yourself a lot of time and hassle and just let Redshift handle your sampling for you. So let's take a look at what we can do in the other tabs here. Motion blur is one of those things that will also slow your renders down, so only use that if you have to. Otherwise, you can do your motion blur in post with plugins like RealSmart. Then under globals, if we've got an RTX graphics card, we can enable hardware ray tracing, which will help speed up your renders as well. Then we come to the trace depth, which is the amount of times each ray type can bounce around our scene. Decreasing these values can also speed up your renders as well, but it does tend to also darken your image. So it's usually best to leave these set to the defaults, but it is worth dialing these down if you really need to shave a few seconds off your renders. We can also turn off or decrease any rays we don't need dependent on our scene. And I know there's no volumes in this particular scene, so we might as well just turn that off as well. So then we're onto global illumination, where I usually use the brute force GI engine, which tends to be the most reliable and accurate. And it also benefits from hardware ray tracing with our RTX cards as well, which can make it even faster. 
There's not much point changing these values because the automatic sampling will adjust these automatically. But if you're setting up overrides, lowering these values will speed up your renders, but you might end up with a noisier image. So again, I usually leave these set to the defaults. Then caustics is another one of those effects that are quite computationally heavy. So leave this switched off unless you're specifically trying to create caustic effects. AOVs can also slow your renders down slightly. So if you intend to do some compositing in post, make sure you're only exporting the passes that you need. Or just disable this entirely and you should get a bit of a speed burst as well. Then we've got optimizations where we can find the cutoff thresholds. And this just allows us to terminate the calculation of our rays a bit sooner, which can also lead to faster renders, but often at the cost of increasing the level of noise. Well, let's give this a try. This render is currently 8.6 seconds, but let's see what happens if we increase these values slightly. And now we've dropped that down to 6.3 seconds and the image doesn't look a whole lot different. Maybe just a tad more noise in the shadows here, which we could always clean up with more samples or the denoiser. So that's another option as well if you really want to squeeze every second out of your renders. But I'll just reset that back to the defaults. And finally, over in system, we could try playing with the bucket size, which might also speed up your renders ever so slightly. Axon suggests not using the smallest bucket size setting of 64 for GPU rendering because it'll fail to utilize the GPU processor effectively and not to use the largest size of 512 if you have multiple GPUs for a similar reason. So your best bet is to stick with the default size of 128, but we can experiment with this. It's currently an 8.4 second render, but if we increase the bucket size, That's now 7.6 seconds. And because I only have one GPU, let's try 512 as well, which is slightly faster again at 7.2 seconds. So it could be said that the larger the bucket size, the faster the render. But also keep in mind, the larger bucket size will also require more VRAM. So depending on the demands of your scene and the amount of VRAM your card has, you might wanna just leave this set to the default value of 128 but still it might be something worth experimenting with. So that's our Redshift render settings all optimized. So let's close this and take a look at our Redshift preferences. With our devices here, if you've got a decent GPU installed or multiple GPUs, just select those and not your CPU because CPU rendering is generally much slower and you don't want that bogging you down. And at this point, you probably also don't want hybrid rendering enabled either, because that will try to share the load with the CPU as well, which is only going to slow things down. So just let your GPU do all the work. And another thing that's going to slow you down is the material previews. I'd suggest always leaving this switched off because loading materials constantly is going to kill the redshift render view and make working on your shaders really slow. Instead, if you really wanted to get a look at your material thumbnails, you could stop the render view and temporarily enable this. Then just come up to the Redshift menu to Tools and Render All Materials. And once it's generated all the material previews, just go back here and disable it again to keep things running nice and fast. And another thing I'll mention as well when it comes to materials, if you're using any of the materials from the Cinema 4D Asset Browser, such as our lovely CG Shortcuts Redshift Material Database. If we were to grab one of these materials, like this dark marble shader here, and apply that to our Redshift logo, and fire up the render view again, which is still in bucket mode, so let's switch back to progressive. And I'll just tweak the projection and scale of this as well to fit our object a bit better. You'll notice if we open a material, and try to tweak any of these nodes in here, like this color correct, for example. Say we wanted to increase the gamma to brighten this material up. If we increase this value, and I've actually clicked already, but nothing's happening. And it's super, super slow. And it takes ages to update in here as well. And that's because if we take a look at the texture map in our shader, you can see that that path is pointing directly to within the database. And Cinema 4D asset databases are actually compressed and very slow for Redshift to pull from and work with. 
but we can fix that very easily by first pausing our render view. Then if we head over to window and to the project asset inspector, we'll get a list of all the assets in our scene and where they're stored on our computer. And we can easily identify which assets are coming directly from the database because they look like this. So it's just a matter of grabbing all those and clicking here to consolidate the assets. Then we just need to navigate to where our local text folder is within our project. And if we select that, it'll copy all of those out of the database and into the text folder. And you can see the paths have now updated as well. And now if we close this and fire up the render view again, everything should be running a lot faster. And if we try to tweak our material again, it should be back in near real time. And that's much better. So that's pretty much it for optimizing Redshift to get faster renders. If you do need even more speed to meet your rendering deadlines though, you can also use a render farm, which can get the job done in a fraction of the time. The farm we use most is Drop and Render, which works really well with Redshift. It's super easy to set up and very cost effective as well. So if you're in need for an even faster solution and you'd like to give them a try, there's a link below to where you can sign up and get some free render credits as well. Don't forget you can download a handy checklist of what we've discussed today over at cgshortcuts.com forward slash redshift. So all the best with your redshift rendering and I'll catch you next time. Thanks for watching. If you learn anything from this tutorial, you're guaranteed to learn loads more with CG Shortcuts Pro Membership. Check it out over at cgshortcuts.com. In the meantime though, here's some more videos you might like.